So in a previous video, we talked about the idea of sex linkage, and we also talked about the idea of hemizygous genes. Now, remember that if you have an X chromosome, and both genders will have at least one, uh, you're going to be exposed, perhaps, to a certain disorder, right? Let's say, for example, that you have both these axes have the disorder, but then you throw in there uh, a male gene, uh, a Y chromosome, that it doesn't say anything about the disorder, so this person will absolutely show the disorder. It's going to be positive for the disorder. But if you have a female that has a protective X chromosome, theoretically, she's going to be negative for the disorder. And this is happening more often in males than females because the males do not have a second X chromosome. So they're hemizygous for the X chromosome, and that's all the genes in it. However, what is gets tricky with humans and a lot of other animals is that there's actually... Uh, something else that tends to happen to females. You only ever need one X chromosome, and the proof of that, of course, is males. The males have one X chromosome, and they're fine. You don't need two X chromosomes to survive. And so, in females, actually something interesting happened. In females, you have something that's called X chromosome deactivation. So this is the idea that X chromosomes, when you have two X chromosomes, which, of course, is going to happen in females, so you're going to have two X chromosomes, Always, one of these X chromosomes coalesce. So one of the X chromosomes is going to basically curl up and coil up in what's called a bar body. So you see that word over here, a bar body. And this kind of happens randomly. Whenever a gamete actually meets another gamete, and it happens to be a girl, so the dad donated an X, the mom donated an X, the, the gamete of the mom and the gamete from, from the dad will get together and form a zygote, which is XX, female. Now, at the very instant when the two axes will combine, right before the first division, one of those axes becomes deactivated and curled up and curled up in what we call the bar body. Now, what's interesting about that is that if the X that's deactivated, let's say, for example, that we're talking about a, a genetic disorder here, and the red X is good and the, the bad and the blue X is okay. So let's say that, for example that the blue X were to become deactivated. Now, what you have left is the bad X. So that means that even though you had a protective gene on the other X, because that X was deactivated, you're going to show the disease. Now, that throws a wrench on what we talked about, about the idea that the females are more often carriers than males are. If there's such a thing as an X chromosome deactivation, it is likely that a female will have the disease even if she's a carrier. Theoretically, she's not supposed to because she's going to be heterozygous for the trait and should have a protective wild-type gene that's dominant over the recessive. However, since there is uh, X chromosome deactivation, that means that that's not necessarily true. If the deactivated chromosome is the, is the good one, that means you're going to have the disease because you deactivated your protection, basically. However, Females are still less likely than males to show the disease because they at least have a 50% shot of being protected in case the bad one gets deactivated what, what, during the deactivation. And since the process is usually random, females do at least have, when they're carriers, a 50 shot at not having the disease. While guys, because they only have one X, if they have the bad X, they always show the disease. So even though X chromosome deactivation plays a factor that screws up what we talked about in the previous video, which means girls which are carriers can sometimes show the disease when the wrong X deactivates, guys will have a higher tendency regardless because they don't have the protective X. So for example, if you have a female that carries a trait uh, that's problematic and that she sh and then she's actually not showing the disease, perhaps, because that was the one gene that got deactivated. And then she has one good gene to protect, protect herself from it, which is why she's not showing the disease. And then she goes ahead and has uh, children with a male that does also carry the disease. So he has a problematic X. And the Y doesn't say anything about it. So like, what are you going to get with something like this? We talked about that before. You're going to have Y chromosomes over here, Y chromosomes over there. And you're going to have one normal male, right? And this male will cannot have the disease because it doesn't have any bad genes. And you're going to have another male that's going to be problematic, right? And then you're going to have a female that's definitely going to have the disease because it has no matter which one gets deactivated, you're going to have a problem there. And then you have a female that has supposedly is going to be a carrier of the disease and not show it. But 
remember, because of X chromosome deactivation, it's not going to be that simple, not that clear cut. One of these two genes, one of these two chromosomes gets coiled up and deactivated by methylation processes, which are actually going to be causing the female to either have or not have the disease. The difference between this female and this male here is that that male has absolutely no chance of protecting himself while the other the female actually does so even though hemizygous X chromosome inactivation actually causes females to be essentially like males hemizygous for the X chromosome since one of them deactivates at least they have a chance that the one that does the that does stay activated happens to be a good one well that's never gonna happen to them to a male because they only have one X so no chromosome deactivates now this will also happen exactly like I just mentioned about the being the idea of the hemizygous gene whenever there's some sort of mutation that deletes a piece of the chromosome so let's say for example that you have uh, someone wants to have brown eyes right so you have brown eyes if you have a anytime you have brown eyes is going to be because you have a presence of a dominant gene that overpowers the blue eye gene so in this example this over here the person would have normal a brown color of brown eyes well this person should have brown eyes but let's say for example that that piece that was supposed to carry the brown eye got deleted that means the second chromosome that should say something about eye color says nothing about it the only gene I have is little b so this person because of that deletion is hemizygous for that gene and therefore will show the the, the little b about anyways which means this adapts to our idea of recessiveness to not be something that only shows if by itself to something that uh, sorry shows if paired with another one like itself so this adapts our idea that recessive phenotypes only show when two recessive genes pair up to an idea that recessive genotypes are really whenever the only gene you have is recessive so that means either because they're paired up or because it's by itself in a hemizygous setup either because of the male X chromosome is the only one they have or because of the hemizygous uh, X chromosome deactivation in females or because of a deletion event in a chromosome that leaves behind only a recessive gen genotype so you can see what we're talking about now the last thing we're going to talk about in this topic is how that deactivation actually takes place right so basically uh, as we talked about the structure of the chromosome, we talked about those histone molecules which actually help coil up the DNA. Now, if this histone molecule um, receives certain particles, and they're abbreviated here, right, like HDACs, MPBs, and basically these are factors which increases the chances of the chromosome being methylated. Now, by, by methylated, what I mean is that literally a methyl group, which is a CH3, uh, CH3, functional group will attach itself to the double helix and basically deactivate the helix what how does it do that it forces those those histones to call upon themselves even more than usual and the double helix to call itself apart even more than usual which stops transcription from happening which means the DNA was no longer being copied into proteins because it's too called up and the enzymes which copy and transcribe the DNA are no no longer able to do their job that's how the DNA is methylated, which causes the, the chromatin to deactivate and become too coiled up to actually perform anything. And at the same time, this, this, the, the double helix itself also becomes unreadable by the enzymes in charge of the transcription process that's important for the protein synthesis. So that's how one of those X chromosomes gets deactivated in females. So it explains how that works. Now, this actually leads to another interesting thing that happens in bio sometimes, which is called genomic imprinting. Now, if, 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 it sounds like a lot, but it's actually yeah, very easy to understand. An example of genomic imprinting is when, when in mammals, uh, males grow more than females, for example, because the, they, they, are, they, are, they receive, they're open for the reception of a certain chemical, more than the growth factor chemical, more than females are, or vice versa. Sometimes females are bigger, too. Or look, for example, tigers and lions, that the male and the female have different looks. They have that, that, this different look. In lions, the males look completely different from the females, right? And so that is an example of genomic imprinting. The same gene is treated differently depending on the gender. So how does that happen? Basically, if you receive the, the different gene, all right, from mom or from dad, 
They are epigenetically silenced in the sperm or the egg. What does that mean, Mr. Lima? All right, it means that the environment changes a male gene different from where it will change a female gene. So if you receive a chromosome from dad, the environment might deactivate this gene. But if it's from mom, it might not deactivate that gene. And so depending on whether or not the, the, the sperm receives an imprint from a maternal DNA, it's going to have or not the certain feature, and vice versa for the egg. And so that's how you get diseases like, for example, Angelman's disease or Prader-Willi's disease, which acts different in males and females. Uh, Angelman's disease is more common in males because you basically inherit a piece of DNA from that is different, treated differently from dad than it is from mom. So when the paternal DNA is problematic and the paternal DNA has, has nothing about it, so it's not imprinted, you have this, this, this problem. And the same thing is true about the prior willow disease where the maternal DNA is problematically imprinted, but the paternal DNA says nothing about it, and so you have no protection from it, and therefore you're going to be uh, having the problem. And this leads to things like uh, mental retardation, uh, strange uh, facial features, uh, being overweight, and a lot of other problems as well, which you're going to learn about when we do the sick genes activity later in the year. But this is what we call genomic imprinting, and it happens in humans as well, of course. And it's also what causes males to be different from females in some characteristics. Not all male characteristics are carried by the Y chromosome. Some of those things are happening because the genes are treated differently depending on whether they're male or female. Uh, or in other words, uh, if you receive the gene from a paternal DNA, it might be imprinted. But if it's received from a fraternal DNA, it might, it might not or vice versa, depending on the specific trait that you're talking about. All right, so it's very interesting stuff. And again, that happens through processes like DNA methylation, like we talked about before, which only happens uh, in, with a certain gender in, in different traits. All right, so from here, we talk about pedigrees in our next video, and I'll see you guys then.